Welcome to Anna Prosecco and welcome back to you wonderful viewers. And I am here with my son, Nick. And Nick, I'm excited to share the kickoff of season two. And you're my first guest of season two as we are exploring Antarctica. We are on a 35 day trip to Antarctica, thanks to Nick and his company, Lindlad Expeditions. We started this mother-son journey at the very end of 2023. We have a fun story to share with you about how we got here. And I'm just delighted to kick the new year and the new season off. So cheers, Nick, with Inna Prosecco. I'm having a sparkling rosé and we're recording in our cabin. The Endurance is one of Lindblad Expedition's newest vessels, and this 35-day epic Antarctica trip began when we started our trip out of Sarasota and took a bus to Miami. But before we get to that, I really want to get to talking about Nick's journey as he has decided to really kind of follow Dad's footsteps. So Nick, I want to first to share um, your story about once you graduated and your path initially and how it has led you to this extraordinary opportunity. Well, I first graduated, decided that I wanted to go to college somewhere close. So I chose CU because most of my friends were going there. I really liked the curriculum and it just seemed like the best option for me. So I applied, got in, found a major in communications and advertising. Was really looking forward to learning more about that and pursuing a career in that. But COVID ended up hitting uh, my second semester and that really took everything out of college for me because it was now all online. The college experience had been altered and I was not an online learner. So I knew that I did not want to go back to school and was looking to branch out and do a gap year somewhere until the whole COVID thing rolled over. And I ended up finding the program Seamester, which was 90 days aboard a, a tall ship, a sailboat that I spent in the Caribbean going from Grenada all the way to Bermuda. It was a 112 foot schooner. And how many other passengers? There were 27 students and seven staff, so there were 34 of us total. A few people dropped off. I think we ended with 27, actually. But that was amazing. We learned how to sail. We did a yacht, classic yacht regatta in Antigua and just were able to travel all over the Caribbean. When I was on the trip, about halfway through, I think right on the 45-day mark, I got a text from you guys saying that we were moving from Colorado. So flying back from Bermuda, I had moving to look forward to. So I started packing my stuff up for Florida, getting ready to leave Colorado, and had my eye on finding a job on the water down there in Florida. So that was mainly yachting stuff. And Seamester, coincidentally... was also based out of Sarasota, is, where we were moving, yeah. Well, what I thought was uh, really wonderful about Seamester is that we could follow your journey and that we were able to go online and that you and your student, co-students and, and passengers were being able to report back on what the day's activities were. And I had just sensed the joy that you were experiencing and not just getting your different levels of diving certification, but also the joy in the photos that were shared that you were beaming, and I think because of your passion for the water, just being yes. on the water. Yeah, I definitely realized on that semester trip how much I loved the ocean and just sailing in general, so it was a goal of mine to get back out on the water as soon as possible. I saw a difference also because when you were at university, I didn't, maybe the freshman year, that first semester, you were really excited, but I think, yeah, COVID had changed a lot for everyone, 
right? So for students, for employees working remotely, everyone remotely, and yes, and some people do well remote learning. And what I appreciated in your dad always says the story is that when you said, I really want to take a gap year because I don't want to waste your time, or I, you don't want to waste your time and you didn't want to waste any money on remote learning because you weren't learning. Not really, no. So when you went to Seamaster, you were also taking some courses, not necessarily that would apply towards college credit. I mean, it, you were receiving credit, but not something that would necessarily go back to with um, your major at yeah. CU. No, it was, these were all elective credits that had no help towards getting a major in communications and advertising. And so when you decided that after semester you were looking to help us move, which by the way, I have to tell you that Nick was such an incredible help. He has such a talent for organization and your exec the executive processing skills that you have to know how things fit, the spatial, <clears throat> visual spatial organization that you have, and you have that with your dad too. It's, it's just this amount of support that you gave us when we moved because I think when your dad and I decided to finally move, it wasn't because we had planned it. We really, you know, you were probably in shock <laughs> to hear the news that we're selling the house. That's not something that we had remotely talked about because we were really also going to wait until your brother graduated and that Jack was going to complete university and then maybe we'd think about moving, but, and we talked about Florida, but when you got wind of it, how did that make you feel? Well, you talked about moving so many times that I thought it was just another charade. It didn't feel real until the moving truck finally showed up and the boxes <laughs> started going in. So I, I didn't expect to move until we were already in the process of moving. How did that make you feel leaving your childhood home and Denver and the place that you grew up in Colorado? It didn't feel real until you guys left and I was locked out on our porch for three hours. <laughs> and then it all kind of hit right at once where it was like, yeah, this is no longer my life here anymore and I'm moving onward. And I think it was a great transition for me because I was waiting to go to the airport for Vegas. With your friends. Yes. Kind of like the last hurrah when yeah. you all turned 21 and that was your agreement to go mm -hmm. to Vegas together? So it was like... A goodbye for me because I let everyone went to Vegas I said goodbye to Colorado and then flew to Sarasota so it was goodbye to my friends and goodbye to Colorado with a week of gambling and I think that the gambling took the sting away <laughs> instead of you, actually leaving my childhood home you were like oh I, I just blew whatever amount yeah <laughs> in Vegas quick that I'm not going back what, what happens in Vegas stays literally in Vegas mm -hmm. <laughs> so then when you were sitting on the, the the front steps and all those years of taking pictures the first day of school how did that feel for you the same I mean they were just the steps uh, I, I drove away from the house and in driving with your dad and, and our dog, Bentley, I think I cried for three hours. I wasn't indifferent. I love the, the house that we have. I love where we live. So leaving wasn't like a, a joy, but it was, it was definitely a new chapter. And I think that was something I was looking forward to. Well, I, you know, what I really respected about you too is that you're also taking a big leap because most of your friends stayed at college and graduated. What you decided after your gap year with semester and said, you know what, I really want to find a job on the water. And in doing so, you moved with us to Florida. And so you were moving away from your friends. We were moving away from our friends. And we just rented an Airbnb for 30 days, and we had not even decided where we were going to find a rental. It was really the go time once we got there. It took maybe a week to just enjoy a little bit of the Airbnb, going to the beach, and enjoying the pool. But once it got closer to that end of the month, where we we're like, we need to find a rental. Uh, just having your help there and honestly Nick you being there was 
a, a joy, but it helped me in my transition so that it wasn't like, oh, now we're empty nesters and we're going to Florida and my, our kids are off somewhere else. It was a, as much of a transition to have you with us that I really enjoyed. And for you though, however, you left your friends behind and moving to someplace new, it wasn't like you were able to meet up with new friends your age. No, I was very bored. I was just trying to find a job so that I could expand my wings and it took a little bit to get the ball rolling but once the job was secured and I got it I took off on the flight to Panama and never looked back well okay so let's step back and so what was your journey because it wasn't just like oh I, I, I'm moving to Florida with my parents and now I have this job there was a process that you started yes so getting there to Florida there was a lot of free time so I spent that free time just looking for the best way to get a job on the water whether that be yachting or cruise ships or oil rigs container ships car transports whatever it was I just wanted to know what the best kind of job was on the water not necessarily pay wise just through the experiences that the people had so everyone had different things to say about yachting. Some people had good experiences, some people didn't. Everyone has their own opinions on cruise lines and what they're doing, for work at least. So it was, it was interesting to kind of see each aspect through workers' eyes. But I knew that I just wanted to travel the world and I needed to find a job that would let me do that. So the from the yachting aspect of that, you're looking for somebody that also wants to travel the world and you kind of have to get lucky with the itineraries that they want to do. You're not just sitting there watching their boat in a port. So I, I kind of withdrew myself from the yachting world because that was more of a luck of the draw and started looking at more ships that traveled the world and I ended up finding Expedition Cruise Lines. I didn't really look into Expedition Cruise Lines that much. I didn't know about Lindblad Expeditions. And it was a, a, a former classmate of yours. Yes. His mom, I knew, mm -hmm. and she's wonderful. Heidi was the one that said, hey, if Nick's interested, she works for a third party that had told me about Lindblad Expeditions, and she said, they're hiring. And so you spoke to somebody she put us in touch or gave me the name of a person for you to to reach out to and you emailed her um, from the recruiting i emailed division. her yeah from the recruiting side she told me what what things i needed to get uh, i needed to get an stcw um, which is it's uh, seven different uh certifications that i got for a training that is required for most ships uh, for emergency situations so that is just a class that I had to go to. You have to take that on the water. It's a firefighting class as well. So you dress up in a firefighting uniform and fight fires to get that certification. And then you also have to get a TWIC card, which is another form of global entry just from ports and stuff like that. So it allows you to go into restricted areas of boats and ports and things like that that are necessary for deckhands to get into, such as a mooring bow where we're dropping our anchor or the engine room in case of a fire or something like that. And the certification is a, an able-bodied seaman? No, uh, the SDCW is its own certification. It's solely for emergency situations on boats. An able-bodied seaman is uh, a completely different thing that has different tests for different aspects of the marine world. When you learned that there was a position available, there was also a difference in deckhand roles. So you became a contract, and so describe the difference between what a, a seasonal versus a rotational contract. Seasonal deckhands do not have a license. So I did not have a license. Rotational deckhands do have a license, whether that be the Lindblad license, which you can get as soon as you finish your first four month contract as a seasonal deckhand or a higher captain's license. So the rotationals are working 7, uh, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. every day for two months. And then they have one month off. They're driving Zodiacs around with the guests inside of them. 
and that's the only other like differential role that they have that we don't. They have a license to drive guests, whereas we do not. Other than that, we're doing the same type of thing. The seasonal deckhands just rotate throughout the every week you rotate six hours in a shift. So you're working around the clock every month, getting used to different schedules so that you're working the night shift, day shift, half and half, doing everything that is required on the boat. So we're running operations, like getting the boats down, dropping the anchor, getting guests back and forth from shore, getting the divers down. When we have divers on board, we're the, uh, we watch them, we're the dive boat. It's just kind of whatever is needed on the boat to happen, the deckhands are sent to go do. And then we're in charge of emergencies as well. Each person has their own job in an emergency, but the deckhands are kind of the firefighters, the ones that launch the rescue boats and life rafts and things of that nature. It's a lot of the behind the scenes that people probably don't realize. <clears throat> and it's something that I want to touch on as far as this mother-son voyage. And I'm learning a lot from you as these passengers who are so intrigued with your story of as a deckhand. You know, they, they love hearing about what the behind the scenes and, and your journey on this. But I want to touch back on something because you had to get through this certification first. And then when you first started submitting all of the certifications so that you were ready to get your contract signed, it took longer than you expected. And I think you started the process in August, then waited until September, was hoping to be able to get on on October, but it was until December and it was the week before Christmas. It was five days before Christmas that I left. <sighs> and it was the first Christmas away from Colorado and all of our traditions. And the fact that you were gone, Jack, your brother, had flown in from Denver on his holiday break. And because we were newer to Florida, we didn't have the connections. And these were things that Christmas is my favorite holiday. And so I would love to coordinate these holiday teas with my girlfriends and then the Christmas parties where we'd have the games for the kids and the adults and even New Year's um, where just having plans to celebrate and bring in the new year I was very melancholic not having you there was a big hole in my heart and for you it was the start of this adventure yes <laughs> I was <laughs> I was having the time of my life. <laughs> so, mom and dad are at home. Jack is probably like, a, I know he was wishing that you were there too. So, our family dynamic on that first Christmas, away from those traditions and, and who we knew and what we knew, and, and you're beginning your journey, really. So, for me, it was New Year's that had the flip the switch, and I asked you, well, how was New Year's for you? And what were you doing on New Year's? Sleeping. Um, yeah, I think I was working the night shift, so. And you're like, oh, it's just another day. Yeah. I didn't know it was Christmas until I got up and saw people dancing around a tree. I didn't know it was New Year's until the day after when somebody was like, what was your New Year's resolution? I was like, didn't even know it was the New Year. <laughs> Um, so what was your rotation, the first one? When I first got on the boat, I was working 9 p.m. to 9 a.m. So I was working the night shift, and I was just adjusting to the first week of working on a boat. When you flew out that first time and, and you'd packed your your very big bag, what were what were your feelings? You'd already kind of had a little bit of that with Seamaster where you were totally prepared to bring stuff and pack for it for a long period of time, which a lot of people don't get that experience of like being on for three months or, or longer. And here you are, you're going to a job where you're gonna be gone for four months. I was mostly just worried about traveling to Panama by myself alone for the first time. I had no idea what the customs was gonna be like. I don't speak Spanish very well, so I had no idea how I was gonna to get to the hotel, what was gonna happen there, if I was gonna be able to get to the ship. So I wasn't really worried about the ship. It, it was one thing at a time that I was worried about, so. I had to check off getting to the airport and getting to making my flight on time. And I had to make sure that I had my bag there at the airport and nothing was messed up there. And then I had to get through customs, which is a whole process in itself because they have their own line for the mariners. And 
since I don't speak English and the the thing that was sent to me by Lindblad was not exactly correct they weren't letting me through so it took probably three hours to get through customs so everything was kind of like a I gotta finish this step first before I get to the boat and then when I got to the boat it was like well now you're in it can't really there's no going back yeah can't really leave now <laughs> So you never told me that before. Mm-hmm. It was quite a process just to get to the boat. And then when you got there, and of course you're working your tail end off because your 12-hour shifts are consistent. Oh, the boat just rocked. We just hit ice, <laughs> and it was probably a little bit of a shell shock, right? Because now you're like, oh wow, I'm on 12 hours, and you're go go go. But you like that. I do. I, I was just trying to get used to. The, that lifestyle in particular. I didn't want to be the new person. I wanted to fit in seamlessly, even though I had no idea what I was doing. And oh my gosh. I never lived on a boat. Nick, you and I are so much alike that way. Like, we just want to feel like you'd know that that was the boat rocking again, hitting ice. <laughs> we're going to explain a little bit where we are. But when you were able to uh, have your first week uh, as a deckhand, how did that go? Just fine. I didn't really change any expectations. It was it was very much like, this is how we do things on the boat this way. And it was very similar to what we did for, for my first boat, at Vela. Yeah. Uh, it was just security rounds at night, clean the areas of which they can't clean during the day, such as the galley floor, the dining room floor, do like the little tiny maintenance things to get everything prepped for tomorrow morning um which is is all like easy stuff so it was learning what that boat needed done that night or for that time period and it was very much just picking up what people were telling me to do and getting it done as quickly as i could there wasn't much of a change it, it kind of felt like just getting back into the flow of living on a boat I think the good thing is that you had that experience on Seamaster because not everyone comes on as a deckhand with even that opportunity, right? Uh, yeah. Most people that were deckhands have been on a boat before because you need the STCW and TWIC card. And most people that are brand new on board come on as stews. And we've had a lot of stews chan transfer over to the deck side because they want to do it. It's a fun job. But normally, getting on a boat for the first time is where the stews usually lie. So they're getting on, kind of realizing what seasickness is, what living on a boat is like, and what the days are like, versus I, I would say 99.9% .9 of deckhands have all lived on a boat before and have all come with some kind of knowledge of this is what I am supposed to do and I've done this before. You know you fortunately have really saw sea legs like your dad and you never got sick when you were on the Vela for the Seamaster program as others were getting sick and so you probably just fit right in when you started on the quest. Yes and the vessel quest and so for you and learning something brand new how was that for you like were you just like was this learning like I would imagine like when you were coming from remote learning sitting in front of a computer versus hands-on <laughs> um, hands-on learning is so you're experiential fun. you've yeah. always been an experiential learner and I, I prefer that as well mm -hmm. it was great to learn what this particular vessel needed to be done that was that was the joy in it for me is finding out what works in this way and what's needed to happen and what can be improved upon those are my biggest things i like to see how things are how things work how they're operating and kind of dissect that and see if i can improve upon it or just know the little intricate details behind everything so that I know how the process works. You were very passionate about it, I know that, because we didn't hear from you. And I know there's uh, an element of like whether or not the ship would have 
Wi-Fi access. You know, we, so we were communicating through WhatsApp, and especially over the holidays, where I just wanted to be able to hear from you, and and so we'd go through weeks not hearing from you, Nick. And how was that for you? Because I'm sure you were like, I, I'm in heaven right now because this is all a big classroom for me on a vessel that you're getting a whole nother realm of education. You don't view it as a classroom. It's just your life. And that's the best part about it. It's not something that you're forced to learn. It's something that you just learn by doing and being a part of. It's forced upon you in a different way. This is now your life. This is what you're living. This isn't something that you have to do because that's what somebody wants you to do. It's something you have to do because that is now your way of living. You're living on a boat. You're around what's going on. So you have to be a part of what's going on. And you have to you have to adapt your skill set and your everyday wants and needs to be what's best for the boat and what's best for the people that are around you. It's, it's, it's not a classroom, it's just your adaptive environment that you're having to always switch and differentiate and learn. You're always being molded by your environment and that's the best part about it because you never know what that environment's going to need or how you're going to react in that environment, but you're there and it's going to happen one way or another. So that's the learning aspect that I enjoy. You're not forced to learn, but you're forced to learn. Well, it's a new environment, as you said, and you're living in close quarters. You know, we're, we're sharing a cabin that is 200 square feet, maybe I think 204 to be exact. And, and we're having to navigate, but what is your, what's the size of your crew cabin? Oh, I, I wouldn't know the square footage, but definitely not as big as this. Um, probably half the size, maybe. That's tiny. A little bit bigger, two thirds. Yeah, and, that, and so, and, and but you're just like, this is a place where I store my stuff and I sleep. Mm-hmm, yep. And, and how That's is it. that adjusting from when we moved, you have your own room, and now you're sharing quarters with one to two other people? It's not like you really want to be in your room the entire time. The places you go on these trips are so amazing and spectacular that you don't really want to be below the waterline. You want to be out and about, even if it's in the crew lounge, you just want to be above water because you got a better chance of seeing something cool there's a whole element of the boat life that is behind the scenes that i'm sure guests don't know about but that's <laughs> it's it's a whole interesting life that you're living because that the the boat is your home the boat is where you live and it's it's your space. It is everything all in one. So you kind of have everything put together in one small area, but it's so expansive and so massive that you you don't want to miss out on anything. So you're always out and about when you can be so that you're, you're seeing the next best thing. That's cool. You had an option working those four months to be able to have a day off, to be able to take an excursion and go and explore the, the area. So talk about what your first one was, because this was, you said, Panama Canal, and that's incredible. Where was the vessel starting and ending for the, the cruise itinerary? I, when I first started, I didn't necessarily have a start and stop point. It was just a back and forth. So... My personal start was in Panama. That's where I got on. I got on Cologne, Panama, went through the Panama Canal, and then went up to Costa Rica and ended in Caldera. But that was just the first trip, and then you go back and forth. The boat is on a constant itinerary. It doesn't stop until it gets to dry dock, and once it's in, once it finish, finishes dry dock, it goes again year-round until dry dock again next year. So it was going back and forth from Costa Rica to Panama, but then we went, actually that's when we had dry dock after Costa Rica and Panama. 
and then after dry dock we went up north to Los Angeles did the Channel Islands and then went um, north again to Seattle after two Channel Islands trips and then did a northbound trip from Seattle to Sitka and or Seattle to Juneau I believe actually that was a two-week trip and then you start your Alaska season where you're going from Juneau to Sitka Sitka to Juneau and then you continue on with the rest of the season so on and so forth and each boat does that each boat has its own itinerary that it follows for the year um, all seasons yeah right so it's not like it's when you say dry dock what's happening at dry dock dry dock is when you're, you're taking the boat out of the water you you put it in like a lock or a channel or canal and then you wall off that area and you drain the water out and then the boat is held up on stilts and it's out of the water so you could repaint it you can do whatever you need to the hull um, some dry docks you don't need to take it out of the water you're just doing stuff to the interior of the boat um, just improving it getting it ready for the next year of guests um, improving behind the scenes stuff such as uh, getting new boats stuff on there or, or zodiac stuff which is the smaller inflatable boats that we take around or kitchen stuff, galley stuff, new sinks, new stoves, whatever it is. That's that's what dry dock is, just getting the behind the scenes stuff on. And provisions. Provisions is a weekly thing that is every turn day. So when guests get off the boat in the morning, the crew is in overhaul mode to get that boat ready to get the, the guests the next set of guests on which will be coming on that day as well around 5 p.m. so we get the guests off around 9 is when everyone's finally disembarked 9 a.m. and then 5 p.m. is when the next set of guests come on so you're turning the boat upside down getting it clean making it look like there wasn't just guests on board getting the cabins all ready to go again and that's when you're taking off the trash from the week before. Uh, you're getting new food on for that new week. Sometimes you'll get a warehouse, which is kind of just more behind the scenes stuff that the crew needs, like uniforms or something like that. So then when you have your next, what I think is fascinating is that people don't realize like when you're getting on the ship, you want, as you said, you're giving them the experience as though they're the first to experience the first of with a week or two week in our case we're on this 35 day when you're talking turnover so that they're anxious to come on board and everything has to be a new experience for them but you're like this is just another week well it's also interesting because every week is a new week um, you're never gonna have the same trip twice you might see something so outrageously cool and incredible one week that you just think will never be topped and then the next week is just as cool and you see something even more incredible that you didn't think would happen because each week you see something different something different is going to catch your eye and that's probably the best part of the job is you get to experience not just one trip which is your trip you get to experience all the different trips and you get to make a season out of it and with the passengers, and the, I know that for you being a deckhand, you may not interact with them as often, but you're, you're getting to be able to ex be part of their experience that they don't understand what's going on behind the scenes. And as we talk about some of the excursions that we're going on, it was really eye-opening, Nick, when you said that when we were on day one, of being able to get do our first landing and we kayaked and you said mom you don't know the amount of hours that went into preparing for you to have this moment where you're like called to come to base camp to get on the kayaks so describe that for others to know like what is it that you're preparing and working so hard to ensure that passengers have the best experience possible so the passengers are getting on kayaks at 9 in the morning and that means that we are usually starting operations around 6, 6.30, three hours before, two and a half hours beforehand so that we can get the Zodiacs prepped, get them filled up with air to so they're nice and inflated 
not squishy so people aren't in fear. Just kidding. It's <laughs> uh, you just fill them up to the regulated pressure point, and then you got to always check them to make sure they're not over infill, over inflated or under inflated. So you're just checking that, making sure that those are all good to go, and then. You got to get the kayaks prepped. You got to get the life jackets for the kayaks good to go. You have to get the count the paddles for all the kayaks. Got to stack the kayaks up, and then get them all hooked up on a crane. Well, first you're sending down the zodiacs that you just inflated, so you're hooking those up with a crane, um, and then sending those off the side of the top of your boat down into the water. Um, those are getting caught by other deckhands, I would be either up top working on the crane or down low catching the Zodiac. And then once I get in the Zodiac, I unhook it, start it up, get it good to go. Then they'll send kayaks down. I catch those kayaks with my Zodiac. I'll get underneath the kayaks as they wire them down. And then I'll get those kayaks adjusted on my Zodiac just right so that when the wire comes down and I unhook it, they're sitting just on my Zodiac and I can drive with the kayaks in front of me. For this boat, they had to open the garage, get the Zodiacs out, get the kayaks out, get the kayak platform out, and then hook up all the kayaks to the kayak platform. So that's a whole process of obviously craning the Zodiacs out, craning the kayak platform out, getting the kayak platform tied to the Zodiacs, getting the Zodiacs in place, getting the kayaks out, and then attached to the platform. And then you can call down everybody that's ready to go for landings, though. You, the staff have to go out 30 minutes before and make sure that the landing site is good to go. And that's just a Lindblad standard. You always want to make sure that the place that you're sending your guests, guests to isn't going to be a hazard or a problem. You don't want to have to change up where you're landing with the guests in the Zodiac. You want to make sure that when they get there it's a nice seamless thing of they get on board the zodiac they're taken to their destination and dropped off and they don't have to think twice about it i think seamless is key and yeah. safety safety being a priority so there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes for boating to make things seamless and safe so that the guests just have access to it right away and they're not waiting for things because who likes to wait i don't like to wait I like to have something handed to me right then and there. So <laughs> an instant gratification. And mm -hmm. and really it hasn't even if you have a full ship, it's it's like that seamlessness that I think is so critical to what uh, as far as the behind the scenes and creating that that people don't know about, right? They think that, oh, my number was called to my group was called to, to come and get on the Zodiac tour or whatever the excursion may be. So Nick, when you, I remember a specific day where I got a call from you and I happened to be getting my hair done for the first time after I found my hairstylist <laughs> in Florida and you called me um, completely upset. Tell me, do you, you know what I'm talking about? As far as the passenger. <laughs> no, I the, have no idea. Okay, the passenger, the passenger that you had to help with a very oh, devastating experience, mm, I, yeah. I recall. It was very emotional for you. Yes, I had to perform CPR on a 95-year-old passenger, or a 92-year-old passenger, who had unfortunately already passed away from a heart attack while snorkeling. It was emotional because it was something that you you wanted to see a better result for, even though you knew what that end outcome was going to be. You just, that's where you kind of are hoping for a miracle and see the light come back in the eyes. But the passenger, unfortunately, was just already gone. He had a great story, though, where this was his first trip, or was his first trip in five years from his wife who had passed away. Um, and he was having the time of his life he loved it. He was looking forward to going snorkeling. So he went out happy. He was living his best life in memory for his wife, who he would always travel with as well. So it's a good way for him to go out in one of the most beautiful snorkeling places in the world, Cueva. And I was happy that I could perform.
perform my job and not freeze up in the moment. You're you're being humble because I also know that for you, you were actually off duty. You happened to be snorkeling that morning. And so describe a little bit of what that meant for you to see that a passenger was being pulled out of the water and what was your natural instinct? Well, I, I noticed how serious the situation was because I hadn't even gone in the water to snorkel yet. I, I just set, stepped, my, like literally just put my two feet in the water when I noticed the boat coming back and CPR already happening. So I just ran over and tried to help in whatever way I could. First, it was just catching the Zodiac onto the beach so that they had somebody there holding the Zodiac in place and it wasn't drifting back into the water. And then it kind of changed into taking over for the doctor and performing CPR. And you had, uh, I think it was, was it your bosun that was also yes. helping? And so the, the passenger who happened to be a doctor basically said, I, I'm, I can't do this right now. And so that's when you stepped in with the bosun and you weren't able to save the passenger's life. And what I thought was really incredible though, is that you had to wait to call. I, I know that you were probably the adrenaline was rushing. And because of where you were, you weren't able to call us on your phone. You had to wait for the satellite phone to be ready or available on the vessel because the family was being informed mm -hmm. and what was very endearing in this conversation is that you called and I and the first question was are you with dad and because I was at my hair appointment dad wasn't there but hearing the sorrow and the pain in your voice that you wanted so badly to save this person and and Really, I just acknowledge you. I, I toast to you, Nick, that what was really incredible about that moment is that I, could, I, I was really happy that you could call and feel like you needed to talk about it. That it was, I think, one of your only, well, first experiences of having to deal with death in that manner. Yes, so firsthand, yeah. And so when you have this excitement about this new experience and then and, and witnessing that. But what I loved is that what ultimately what we were discussing is that you saw this passenger really being able to do what he loved in his final moments. And so when you think of like going on vacation and all the wonderful things that you're doing to create these experiences and this happened, I also think that for most passengers it's nothing that they would ever expect and certainly nothing that anybody would want to have happen but there's different protocol for when passengers pass away away from their home state or home country and I didn't even know that it's different per state or different per country but it's always a, a hassle to get a body back to the United States if you pass overseas simply because now you're not transporting a person, you're transporting an object, and it's a biohazard object. So there's so many regulations that go through transporting a dead body that you just wouldn't think of that it, it just became a problem that was best solved by getting a gravesite there in Costa Rica. And the positive thing is that you realize that these are going to be part of the experience and really the cycle of, you know, the, wow, what in your first four months, what amount of experience that you had in that short time frame and that you were, once your site or your contract was complete, you came home and you just couldn't wait for the second contract. I couldn't. I wanted to get back on the water as soon as possible and that's why we're here on a 35 day trip mm. okay so with that because there's so much more to this story to share and this is the first um of the series of this antarctica trip because we want to also be able to share with you um how this came about for this 35 epic day um, trip through Antarctica. So please join us on our next episode. Uh, please do, if you enjoyed this episode, like, 
subscribe so that you're informed when the next episode drops as well as please comment share your ideas and thoughts and even questions because then we can read through it and and maybe perhaps um, answer some of those things for you so until next time with in a prosecco and the truth serum that i always enjoy cheers to you nick i'm so glad to be on this adventure with you thank you for and, and thank you for being a guest cheers to you until next time bye